Hi, everybody. My name is Beth Gonzalez, and I am the Assistant Director for Global Enrollment at Mercer University in Macon, Georgia. And I work exclusively with our international students, and I am a proud leader in the IC3 movement. I uh, serve on the Content and Research Committee. Kritika? Thank you so much, Beth. Uh -huh. Hello, everybody. My name is Kritika Padode Bhandari. I'm a member of the founding team of Vijayabhumi University, India's first liberal professional university. I also happen to be a lawyer. I'm a graduate from National Law University, Delhi. And very proud to say and share that I'm also an IC3 leader and part of the movement and very strongly believe in it. And I think this is one of the first uh, sort of uh, steps that we are taking to initiate a conversation and create some excitement around the conference that's coming up in Hyderabad in August. Uh, like Beth, I also serve on the content and research committee. So Beth, any opening thoughts from you on this new segment that we have started? Uh, it's really exciting. It's um, just like Kritika said, it is a chance to get in and really dig a little deeper into the various topics that we are going to, um, that we have for our upcoming conference in August. Um, yeah, so I think it's a really exciting um, way to learn more and to um, hopefully pique your interest so that you want to become involved with our movement. Thank you so much, Beth. I think, you know, when we were ideating in the IC3 research and content committee, we realized that to probably raise the bar of the sessions that, you know, the thousands of attendees are going to be attending at the conference this year, it's really important for us to initiate these sort of conversations to increase the amount of perspectives that one can think of of the various themes and the main theme that we have of the conference. So this is a little bit of an effort to get everybody's uh, mind open to different dimensions on this topic. Both Beth and I feel very strongly about one of the sub themes, which is access. And that's what we have chosen uh, as the first topic or the first sub theme that we're gonna be discussing in the rapid five that we have. So I think let's just jump straight into this conversation. Sounds so uh, yeah, let's get going. So yeah. let's over to you first that, you know, uh, how can we make college counseling more accessible? What are your oh, thoughts? On that? uh -huh. that's, a, that's a really great question. Um, so in the United States, we're privileged in that college counseling is a feature of most high schools. Um, and it's really important that schools outside of the United States learn about this model so that they can replicate it and make it better in their own context. So I think we can make it more accessible by number one, education, letting people know what exactly college counseling is, and especially letting the higher ups in um, schools understand the importance of helping kids know what options are available to them. Um, I think that's probably the most important thing. What do you think? I think I totally agree with you that, um, you know, obviously at the points that you said, and I think in the Indian context, something that I would like to add is that, you know, probably we need to start topics and, uh, you know, probably have a conversation around how we can be bringing college counseling to public schools and the larger number of schools in uh, India today, because obviously we have a few number of schools where we have very good career counselors, but there's mm -hmm. also a large set that we are yet to reach out to, you know, the public schools as well. So, I mean, we need to figure out, though, though IC3 is a wonderful way, you know, an overarching movement through which we can take counseling to various places and like, you know, it is being done already. But yes, to probably have a conversation about that, how counseling can be, you know, accessible to students of mm -hmm. all kinds, and there's no sort of differentiation, discrimination on basis of financial capacity, etc. So I think that's a larger um, area that I think needs a lot of exploration, especially in the Indian context. Right. And what do you think is the way to um, move forward to make it more inclusive so that um, more are benefiting from it 
Right. So for me, inclusivity, I would see it on two layers, right? Mm -hmm. um, my first layer where I see inclusivity is the question of how we can include more stakeholders in the process, right? Uh, at times what happens, and here I'm talking about the school setting, um, you know, there are these conversations that are happening between the college counselor and school and the student, but we kind of don't realize that it's really important to bring in a very important stakeholder also in the process, which is the parents. Right. right? So I think that, you know, when we say inclusive, one of my interpretations of that is also making sure all the stakeholders are part of the process and how all these three stakeholders can work together. Because we encounter numerous situations where, you know, parents want a certain thing, students want to pursue a different passion. I mean, the college counselor has a different uh, sort of assessment of the child and what, you know, he wow. or she thinks the right option for the students so i think one is really important that you know we have all the stakeholders in the second level at which i look at inclusivity is a more deeper question where i feel that um you know career counselors and college counselors also need to deep dive into understand their students better mm -hmm. as we understand right now i mean you know there's so many different sort of um you know I would say changes that are taking place in society, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many different conversations. I mean, there's so many different identities that our students can have, which can have a gender connotation, which mm -hmm. can, you know, uh, which can uh, have how they associate themselves. I think it's important for a college counselor to also understand that, to also understand the cultural background of the child, to be able to understand that what is the kind of family setup that the child comes from, what are the sort of challenges that the child is going through and then probably you know effectively uh sort of guide the child that you know what are the sort of um, institutions that embrace those differences that embrace and are inclusive to that culture because we all understand the fact that you know this is such a big leap that a child takes moving mm -hmm. from you know a protected environment of a school and going right. to a university so I think it's so important and mindful for the college counselor to be aware of these things and to be able to, you know, help students match them to the right universities that have the right kind of culture so that students don't feel like a misfit in those universities. So I look at inclusivity also from that perspective. Great, great answer. <laughs> what about you? I mean, I think you would like to add in in this question. No, I mean, I, I think that um, that you're absolutely right that, um, you know, especially parents need to be involved um, and they need to understand that the counselors do have that different view of their student, um, maybe a more realistic view of um, what the child is interested in doing number one and and what they have the capacity to do I think that's really important um, totally agree there. yeah how about training um what do you think is the best way to train counselors to promote diversity and celebrate these differences that kids have so I think definitely one thing I feel that any educator needs to go through is like we all keep saying, right? Learning is a lifelong process. Right. And we need to devote some time in the year when we are probably stepped down from our roles and where we just, you know, don the role of a learner and we're probably learning something new, yeah. right? And when I say learning something new, it need not be just about a new career. It need not be, um, you know, probably about a new field that's coming up, you know, which tends to usually happen because of the kind of packed schedule that counselors have. But I think it's also really important in focusing on raising your emotional quotient, in raising your sensitivity. You know, like I said, right now, especially in the Indian context, the society is going through this huge churn that is happening, right? I mean, the new generation is just sort of exploring itself, they're exploring their identity. Uh, there are so many questions around sexuality. Um, also now, you know, I think uh, with so much of progressive, you know, talk happening in the society, we are also in a phase where people are coming out more openly about the learning disabilities that they have. Um, so I think it's really important that when all of these conversations are happening and our students are at the center of it, we as educators, 
um, and so for the counselors, it's important that, you know, we actually get sensitized and trained to sort of understand that what are these, you know, uh, you know, what are these uh, difficulties that students are facing today? Or if it's a question about, um, you know, it's about gender for us to kind of understand what are the different kind of genders that exist today? You know, what are the different kind of gender identities that students are donning and how we can be neutral towards it and, you know, have a mind That's without funny. any prejudice and a bias. And this is not something that we can do sitting in our institutions. I mean, it's important you need to have experts who have conversations with you. We don't even realize a lot of time when we are speaking um, without even realizing, you know, we might end up saying something which might be very insensitive to a particular group, mm -hmm. right? And that's where I think there's a lot of learning that needs to happen. Like, how do we make our vocabulary gender neutral? Mm -hmm. How do we, you know, deal with situations where, you know, children are going through a difficult phase? We know that, you know, these are times where children are being victims of a lot of mental health issues. Um, yeah. You know, there are situations where children, you know, might not have the best environments at home. So as a counselor, how do you help them in those times, right? And all of that needs a lot of specialized learning and training. Mm -hmm. So I feel it's very important that as an educator, probably, you know, take out one month in a year and say, you know, this is the time when I'm going to focus on picking up something new, like picking up a new skill, which is either going to focus on improving my knowledge about fields or just improving my emotional quotient. Mm -hmm. I think we need to sort of set that time aside for ourselves. And that's also us leading by example. I mean, we keep telling our students, you need to be a lifelong learner, but we need to set that example ourselves too. Absolutely. To yeah, that, Those are that my kind of, ideas on it. What do you think? Yeah, that pursuit of um, personal and professional development is, you know, it never ends. Um, and we should definitely make sure that we're setting a time, um, yeah. setting aside the time to to really work on ourselves because we do work with others so so much. Um, it's not a bad thing to look inward as well. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, super. So I mean, uh, definitely. I mean, since we both come from university setups, I would love to ask you this question. Sure. That um, And I think this is something that every counselor goes through this dilemma today, that how can counselors work more effectively with universities to facilitate university admissions for all? Yeah, I think that's a, you know, that's a really great question. Um, I think number one, reach out, you know, email, call the counselors that your students are interested, um, you know, in going to that school. And when the counselors reach out to you from the university, I think it's really important that um, that you partner together. Um, that's you know that's what I'm looking for as a university counselor is I'm looking for um, for high school counselors, um, guidance counselors who want to partner together so that you know I can reinforce what they're talking about because I know it always makes more sense or it has more gra gravity coming from someone that you don't see every day. So I think, you know, just trying to partner together, um, do, do workshops together for the students, just have a Q&A session with the college counselor and the high school counselor, just to learn about, um, you know, learn about the process more, learn about the universities more. Um, I think that that goes a long way to educate the counselors so that they can educate the students. Um, and the university counselor definitely plays a role in reinforcement and asking questions if they have them. Yeah. Absolutely. I totally agree with you, Beth. And probably I'd just like to add another line there. Sure. Um, also, I think about fitment and um, I don't think I can emphasize this enough, but I feel that even if your students are looking at, um, you know, getting admission into universities with aid, uh, I think it's really important that, um, you know, college counselors, like uh, college career counselors in school actually need to sort of go and understand the ethos, the vibe, 
um, you know, of the campus, what kind of students that you have there, the kind of student profiles that you have there, just to understand that, you know, how well your students would fit into a university. I think this is very, very key. Um, yeah. There has to be this perfect match of fitment that needs to happen so that, you know, this entire journey is seamless and very productive for our students. That's right. So, I mean, like we do for, you know, students otherwise, because if you have a full fee paying students, I mean, we pretty much treat it like, you know, the world is their oyster and, you know, they can choose according to what they want to do and, you know, um, what is the vibe of the campus, what are the kind of opportunities, etc. But when it comes to financial um, aid students, what happens is because the options become very restricted. I right. mean, we tend to not give this a lot of thought. And I feel that this is really sort of important, especially for students who are coming in with aid. So that, you know, they are able to, you know, pursue their scholarship, their studies at complete ease, because we both understand today that students who come on a, on a scholarship are expected to maintain a minimum academic record as well for right. the scholarship to continue. So it has to be a very conducive environment for the student. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Yes. And I think that brings us to the, uh, the fifth and the last question of our rapid five. So yes. I think let's. Let's tie back with the theme of our conference, finding purpose through counseling. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, you know, I think it's a, it's a great uh, conference topic. Um, and we do have many, many different um, areas of focus. So we've got access. That's what we're talking about today. Um, and so, you know, access is just what we've been talking about, giving students of diverse backgrounds, of diverse interests, um, access to good college, good solid college counseling, career counseling. Um, maybe students aren't interested in going to um, an academic college. Maybe they're interested in going to more of a vocational or technical college. That's great. Whatever you know is best for the student, that's what we're looking for. Um, so, you know, some additional like, example topics for this, if, if um, access is what you're thinking about doing, um, you know, maybe presentations about students with learning disabilities, I think, you know, that those students are often overlooked. Um, and I think learning the best way to assist those students would definitely be a great conference topic. Um, and I think talking about, you, you mentioned scholarships, and I think talking about the different types of scholarships that are available um, that could open access for students, that would be another worthy topic um, along the theme of access. Um, do you have any other ones, uh, I think another, one of the other ones I would also think about is in access of, you know, also talking about um, our students who are very proud members of the LGBTQ community, mm -hmm. right? How, how you, you know, you sort of work with them closely and how you help them find universities that are the right fit and very welcoming. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think we both realize that this is such an important period that a student goes through. I mean, either this experience can really uplift your entire outlook to life, or it can be also in certain cases a very scarring experience. So yes. as far as possible, you know, finding your purpose through counseling, which is the larger sort of theme, it's very important because once a student is able to identify the individual purpose, I mean, largely, you know, the road becomes fairly clear and without too many obstacles and roadblocks and them questioning themselves along the way and their decisions along the way. So I think this is a very, very good topic, especially in times like this, you know, where people are talking about the fact that, you know, we have people who are going through midlife crisis, et cetera. You know, they're switching multiple jobs because they are probably not feeling very aligned to the pathway that, you know, they've taken. I think it's great that we are having this conversation today as educators that how do we help students find their purpose and for them to, you know, find that one sort of principle in life, which is their calling. So right. I, I think I think it's 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 a wonderful topic, and there's so much to be said about it and accessibility, especially in the Indian context. I mean, there's so many different con connotations to it. There's a financial connotation to it. 
there's a community connotation to it there's a religious connotation to it um there is a gender connotation to it i mean so many different sort of you know interpretations one can take and you know uh, figure out that how we can make this entire process more inclusive where we are embracing change we are celebrating change we are celebrating difference yeah I think those are my parting thoughts on this, and uh, yeah. it's been so lovely to have this same. conversation. Beth, yes, Kritika, same to you. Um, and you know, if you're interested in learning more, you can go to ic3movement.com. You can learn about the upcoming conference in Hyderabad in August. You can see the theme document so that you can see the overarching theme and then the sub themes that are available. And also remember that we will have um, four more, there are five sub themes. So you'll have four more conversations that you can tune into to learn a little bit more in depth and hear IC3 leaders discuss um, their passion and their um, theme of choice. Absolutely. And as we speak, the session proposals call is open and uh, we are welcoming session proposals. Uh, so the idea is that we hope this little chat and conversation has given you some ideas of how you can spruce up um, your session proposal and what different perspectives you kind of could look at. And we hope to see many of you at the IC3 annual conference in Hyderabad in August this year. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Uh, for you today. Thanks. But yep. One more thing. The deadline for the session proposals is April 15th. And here in the United States, we know that is tax day. So, um, yeah, it's the day we have to turn in our taxes. So 15 April, write it down, get that session proposal in before then. Yes. And we can't wait to read them. So we That's hope right. to see many of you there. And please do submit your proposals. Thank oh. you very much, guys. OK, thanks. Bye.